So the question for today, and you just need to type three significant points, is did we learn from the past? So we've looked at the different civilizations, Athens, Rome, and England. And of course, there's more of that in the second unit. But, of course, the founding fathers researched and looked over and already had some education on previous governments. Three, three of those, of course, being the ones that they used to influence their own decisions in the Declaration of Independence, but later on the Constitution itself. So the question is, did they learn from the mistakes of the past, and were those lessons incredibly valuable? So obviously, democracy in particular from Athens left a considerable influence on them. As we've already mentioned in class, the Founding Fathers did not think too much of the people's decision-making process. And it wasn't just Athens, but also other places as well where rebellions had occurred, uprisings. Shays' Rebellion, for instance, after the Revolutionary War, gave them evidence that the people were foolhardy and emotional and couldn't see through, see through, through things to the end and had a misconception about how the logical world should work. Shays' Rebellion was good evidence of that because... The farmers led by Shea were upset that their homes were being foreclosed on due to unpaid debts. And they couldn't see, of course, that if we just forgave everyone's debts, then the banks would be out of money and companies would be out of money. And so then the debt would just pass on to someone else, causing the economy to become even more ruinous. So the Founding Fathers saw this as evidence, once again, that the people had too much influence in the new state governments, more and more uh, farmers and working class people who had gotten elected to the state legislatures. Some were extremely sympathetic to Shays' Rebellion and perhaps the forgiving of debts, for instance. And so they believed that this revealed the people themselves didn't really or shouldn't really have too much of an influence in actual decision making. So that's one of the reasons why Madison decided to only allow the people to directly elect the House of Representatives. And this actually continued for a considerable portion of American history uh, because it wouldn't be until the progressive era when the Senate, thanks to the 17th Amendment, is also elected directly by the people. So a considerable period of time would go by before that was even expanded further. And of course, even today, the hesitancy about democracy is still prevalent in electoral college and the fact that the judicial branch is appointed and that the Senate, while elected by the people now, goes by six years before you have an opportunity to boot someone out. So some would argue that there are still heavy checks against democracy, but obviously populism is still alive and well. That's why Bernie Sanders was able to do so well in primary elections, and why Donald Trump was able to win the nomination and the presidency. So would the Founding Fathers have favored either two of these candidates or how much popular support they had from the average person? There's a chance that that, of course, might be no. And the question is, is can you have this type of popular support for people cause someone that actually is dangerous to come into the presidency or the House or the Senate. The parties used to have protections against this as well. Whenever they send delegates to the conventions during the summer to pick presidential nominees, uh, the party elite often held positions such as uh, in the Democratic Party, they were called super delegates. They had a different name in the Republican Party. And there was controversy over that during the 2016 election because it believed that they would try to stop Bernie Sanders from advancing and help out Hillary Clinton. Of course, that was nonsensical because Hillary Clinton had already won more regular delegates, so it didn't matter. Uh, but the point was is that the parties do have some kind of checks in place to stop some type of unwise populist candidate from being nominated. However, in 2016, because of that controversy, uh, both parties decreased the influence of these elite delegates and their ability to influence the nomination process. So there are still checks against democracy, but there's still a chance that the people in an emotional decision can still have influence over what we do. And in each of the states, to different levels of degree, 
the people can influence elections after the fact or the law. Does anybody know what it's called when the people are allowed to vote on laws in the United States? There's two different words you can use. One starts with an R and one starts with a P. Does anybody know what those are called? No? Referendum. Yeah, so referendum vote, also called a proposition in some states. In California, they have had numerous propositions proposed over the years, uh, a simple petition of so many signatures can get it on the ballot and the people approve laws. And California is a good, ev good evidence of why that isn't always a good idea because the people in California often approve programs that help but cost money, but never vote in favor of increasing taxes. So that causes a fiscal problem in California where they've often had higher deficits, for instance, from year to year. Uh, the last time they had a serious economic problem, they put all kinds of measures on the ballot to remove these programs that cost money and also raise taxes, but they didn't approve any of that. The only one they approved was to cut the legislators' pay, even though the legislators aren't the ones that put all this crazy programming in place in the first place. So that showed some of the danger of it happening. Other states are a little less trusting of referendums. For instance, in Pennsylvania, the only impact that the voters kind of have in that way is that the state legislature for two years in a row has to approve a constitutional amendment, and then the voters can approve it after that. So you can see that there's some protections against populism in that sense. And then the other way that they can impact states are through recall elections. And that doesn't happen in Pennsylvania, but in other states, if enough people sign a petition they can actually get on the ballot to, for instance, remove a governor from office. And that's what happened in California the last time they had an economic problem. Even though they had just recently, within the last year or so, overwhelmingly voted in the governor, they decided because of this economic crisis to recall him from office. And on the same ballot, it also said you can select a new governor to replace them if he's recalled. Well, there were so many people on the ballot, it was possible for someone to win with just 10 or 20 percent of the vote. And in fact, that's what happened. And does anybody know who the governor was that filled in for the recall? A celebrity in California? Huh? Oh, yeah. It was Arnold Schwarzenegger. So yeah, so he became governor through that recall election effort because there were so many people on the ballot, he didn't really need a majority of the vote. And so he got swept into office because of that recall. So there is still some populism influence in some states more than other. Uh, the next thing I'll mention is republicanism or the republic, the idea of a republic. And certainly we do have that in the United States. In fact, so that, that is actually what we have, not a democracy, a representative form of government. And in the Constitution, it says that all of the states must also have a republican form of government. And so that's why many of them are set up in a similar fashion to the United States government. They, almost all of them, except one, has a general assembly or legislature with two bodies, a house and a senate, a governor that's the executive, a separate judicial branch, and so on. So much of it is modeled after the same way. Although we did recognize the problems with the Roman system, that there weren't enough checks and balances and constitutionality to keep the system rigid enough so that way someone like a Julius Caesar couldn't come in. So we did realize that. And that's why we do have the separation of powers and the checks and balances that are in place. And we wanted to make sure we started off from the bat with a solid constitution, which is why they spent so much time through May through September of 1787 to have a set rigid set of guidelines that could be followed. So that way they weren't just continually going along throughout history like the English adding to it as they went. Uh, but they did recognize, of course, there was also the need for reform. And so that's why they added the constitutional amendment process as well. Although it is a steep climb in order to get an amendment passed. That's why it's only been done 27 times in American history. Other constitutions in other countries have been changed much more often. But for the most part, it looks like our system is pretty much a good thing because we haven't changed it that much structurally. And basically the same system of the three branches and the positions that exist are still there. And when we have had mistakes happen, 
for instance, the way we had the presidency set up at first, where first place went to the president and second place went to the vice president, we decided that was probably a bad idea, so we changed it with the 12th Amendment. And once again, we eventually, with the 17th Amendment, added the direct election of senators. So it is possible to make up for the mistakes of the past, although that becomes harder and harder to do if someone has something to lose. So, for instance, two of the problems that some people bring up would be the Electoral College today, and then also the United States Senate, which has kind of stacked the system in favor of less populated states. California only has two senators, but there's over a dozen states that have a similar population, and they have 24 senators. So some people point out that that is a flaw. But, of course, are any of the lesser populated states ever going to vote in favor of an amendment to change that? And the answer is no. There is one way to increase the influence of more populated states. Does anybody know how that could be done without changing the Senate or Electoral College directly? Does it say in the first article of the Constitution how many representatives there should be altogether? No, it does it first, but then it says it could change. And in fact, the House can change the number of representatives there are. So one way that you could change the system to benefit the larger states, especially when it comes indirectly toward the Electoral College, is add to the number of people in the House. And therefore, the more populated states could have more people, and therefore they would get more electoral votes on top of that because the number of electoral votes you get is the number of House members plus the number of senators. Yes? Wouldn't that be the same issue with the tax and court? Well, yes, because the, the issue with packing the court is that it would be for partisan reasons, and almost assuredly, as soon as the Republicans came back into the majority, they would do the same thing. We, then we'd end up with 10,000 justices on the Supreme Court. They'd have to take it to series of charter buses any type they went out for a meal. So that's a problem with that. However, the House is based on population, and you can make a logical argument that it's just based on numbers. It's not based on partisanship. And on top of that, the size of the average district has gone up, so now it's up to over 700,000. I mean, should it stay at 435 people forever? What happens when that number gets to, you know, 1.5 million per house district? I mean, that's a lot of people for one person to represent directly. So the argument is, is that number should have been changing all this time. In fact, one of the constitutional amendments that failed originally was that it would continually adjust. Uh, of course, if that had stayed in place, we would have like over a thousand representatives at this point. So it has to be done in a little bit more piecemeal fashion. Uh, but it hasn't changed since the early 20th century. So that's why some people think that it should be altered. But once again, obviously, uh, some people are not going to want that to change because for partisan reasons, it would, it would help Democrats more than Republicans. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? All right. Let's go ahead and submit that if you haven't already.